we talk about why it's so important. Like one of the issues that makes this so important is what's happening in Palestine. This just crystallized why we have to eliminate these self-inflicted wounds by teaming up with sellouts. And this article I saw on Socialist Alternative, I, I do want to get into a little bit of that and talking about um, the uncommitted campaign. But first, let me play this video um, from On Strike, your your um, uh, podcast, this video clip that I saw that kind of talks about it. So let's move into the resistance. So some of the part of the resistance, you have people like us that I would say are a lot more uh, radical, but then you have campaigns like the abandoned Biden campaign, um, which is talking about not voting for Biden in November. That was the first sort of campaign that, that was talking about this and they were, they already went national. Then the uncommitted campaign um, came in and did some, you know, it was a good campaign. I must say it is a more, it is a campaign whose goal isn't as radical as the abandoned Biden a campaign, but they still have the potential to be from my, just from my like, point of view. Go, go ahead, Nick. If you just want. real quick, from my point of view, okay, they the the rank and file, like like Shama says, of that movement is dead serious. But then you have the professional managerial class that are trying their best to hijack it and bring it back to the Democratic Party, and I don't think they're going to be successful with that. I mean, and and, and time will prove like me time will prove me correct or incorrect on that assessment. But I think people are mischaracterizing uh, this movement because I do think it's a positive movement. Just because the PMCs are trying to hijack it don't mean it, be, it will be successful. And I'm just saying this anecdotally because I'm talking to a lot of people on the ground. They're like, yeah, nigga, this shit they talking about, about Mike Von for Biden, not happening. <laughs> so I am saying that anecdotally. from what, what I hear I'm you. Talking. So anyway, that's I hear you. Job. That is a great point. That's a great point to insert. Let's play the video and then we'll get more comment after this. Here in the Washington primary and in other cities across the country, worker strike back members organized using a petition in support of the uncommitted movement calling for a new party for working people and a vote for the strongest independent left candidate in November. We talked to many people who had already voted uncommitted or who agreed to do so. I feel, I feel anxious about the election. I feel demoralized about the prospects of having either of them as president again. I guess I just vote for one more just because I dislike the one the most. So it's not like either one is good. It's tough, you know, like four years ago, eight years ago, it was kind of like the same thing. Choosing the lesser of two evils in, in a way is very tiring to try to choose the lesser of two evils every four years. I think a third party would be good because it's like you have to worry about Republicans and then, you know, you have to also worry about a liberal uh, president that, you know, was kind of like saying, I will help you people. And then like, you know, with what's happening with Gaza, like kind of turning his back. They don't understand how we live. So, and I don't think that they ever will. And they don't really care. And I think like that has never been clearer than like, you know, two senile old men running against each other. One of whom is like slightly more virulently racist than the other one. Um, both of whom are like, you know, foaming at the mouth to do more genocide. Before I had difficulty with like accepting that reality, but now I feel like I'm past that point where I don't think I could check either box and go to bed at night feeling like I did my part. And make sure you check out on uh, Strike uh, uh, Shama Sawant's podcast on YouTube. Make sure I got a, I got a couple of more clips later on the show to to also go over. I wanted to play that before, of course, pivoting to you and asking, like, what is your general take of the uncommitted campaign, what they've accomplished, what their potential uh, uh, can be, and what is the next step? Like, is is this it or should this be it? I, I, I You kind of alluded to it already, but if you could kind of go into more detail with those and, and address those questions. Yeah, I, I think this is very important. It is an important development. I really agree with uh, Nick that at the end of the day, the fact that the uncommitted campaign is getting such support, so much support in state after state is a very positive development. Obviously, seeing uh, it from the context of what has happened so far is also important. So I just let me just start from there. I mean, we're seeing uncommitted happen at a time when uh, the 
working class of America, young people in America have seen a Trump regime, a Biden regime. And then what they have seen also is how the Democratic Party absolutely um, just went after Bernie Sanders in 2016 and 2020. And as Socialist Alternative and you and many others uh, on the left had predicted that the Democratic Party would not stand for any campaign or candidate that represents the interests of the working class versus the interests of Wall Street. And, uh, and at the same time, we have seen the squad appear as a, a potential of shift from politics as usual. And there was a huge excitement around it, uh, the election of AOC and others. And then we've seen them, unfortunately, betray the interests of working people again and again. And we've also seen the failure, for the most part, of uh, projects like the DSA. I mean, DSA experienced a huge burst of membership. But then since then, partly because of the, you know, the, the, the positions taken by the elected leadership of DSA themselves, and also because of the positions that DSA as a whole has taken towards the squad, not calling them out when they sold out, whether it was the Jamal Bowman vote for the Iron Dome or for the sellout by AOC and others of railroad union workers. Uh, it, you know, we, if, we don't, if we don't hold these supposed leaders accountable, then what it does is it completely, completely demoralizes and scatters hundreds of thousands, if not more, of ordinary people, working people who are looking for a way to fight back, then get their hopes dashed against the brick wall of selling out by politicians and the other leaders. And then what happens, unfortunately, we see is a fraction, a, a, a subset of them start looking towards right wing populism, you know, right populism as a potential solution, which is again very dangerous. And that is a big part of what is fueling the support for Trump and the reactionary right wing. Or others just get depoliticized. You know, they just feel demoralized and say, you know, I don't even want to pay attention to politics because I feel sold out. And, and you know, in, in this whole um, list of entities and organizations and individuals that engaged in the selling out of working people, let's not forget the leaders of the BLM movement as well, the women's, liberal women's organizations that failed, absolutely failed to mount any fight back against the Dobbs ruling and allowed Roe v. Wade to get dismantled, which was a historic defeat for the women's movement in the United States. So uncommitted is coming in the wake of all of that. And to me, one of the things it shows is that obviously one of the huge weaknesses is the lack of leadership on the left. And you know, most of what has emerged has unfortunately sold out. Uh, and that is a uh, that is an overriding weakness that needs to be overcome by the left. And so in terms of sober assessments, that is probably number one. But it also shows to me that the desire of ordinary people to fight back, their clarity that this system is not working for us, the Democrats are actually not going to be on our side, and um, they are not going to... Um, uh, ultimately, uh, you know, going to change their ways. You know, you saw, uh, I appreciate you playing the clips of the street interviews that On Strike did uh, to get the views of just ordinary people, young people about what they think about where this is going and what they, what they feel about what their choices in November. All of this shows that now more than before, more and more young people and working people are clear what's not working. But what's missing is what can work, and I think that is where that that was the that was what we were trying to uh, flesh out in that episode. I hope your viewers watch it. It was all about uncommitted, what it means, and so on. And I think so. In 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 all of this context, uh, what you're noting about the leadership of abandoned Biden and uncommitted is is important. And then sort of taking from there to the rank and file, I think it's really important that the to note that the rank and file of whether whether an ordinary person who voted in the primaries, whether they consider themselves part of uncommitted or abandoned Biden, you know, regardless of which organizational label they subscribe to, the rank and file of the movement, it's important to note, is voting based on their anger. And they may not even necessarily know 
who the leaders of the abandoned Biden or uncommitted are, uh, or in various states you have listened, listen to Michigan, listen to Washington. I, I'm I, I'm I'm sure that the vast majority of people who voted uncommitted in Washington State, for example, had no idea who the leaders of listen listen to Washington are. They are voting uncommitted because that makes sense to them, because they are angry at Biden and they are also. Uh, expressing their anger against Trump. Uncommitted means uncommitted to anybody. You know, this is my position. Uh, and it's a rejection of both parties. And that's very important. And so they don't necessarily know what the leaders of uncommitted or abandoned Biden are saying. They've heard about the general idea about uncommitted and they're voting against Biden and Trump. Uh, so I think that's another important point to note. The third point I'll make is that uh, it, it is crucial that uh, at least a section of the leadership of abandoned Biden has said that we are calling ourselves abandoned Biden because we, um, you know, we are not going to go for Biden in November. And I think that some of them will probably stick to that that position. But at, at the end of the day, I fear that most of the leadership of these campaigns will end up voting for Biden and end up, in, more importantly, calling for a vote for Biden uh, because. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no solution, and and some of them, I think, unfortunately, are already planning to do that, and some of them uh, are, you know, I, I will admit, being honest. Some of them are being honest, and they're saying, "I'm not breaking from Biden. This is for me. Uncommitted is making Biden a better candidate." Obviously, needless to say, socialist alternative workers strike back, and I do not agree with that view whatsoever. For us, this is not about making Biden better. This is about finding a way, showing a way to channel the anger and frustrations of millions of American people, um, working and young people, and say, this is the way to go. We need to break from both the Republicans and the Democrats. And in, in that, with that logic in mind, we are urging people to vote uncommitted. So the petitions that you showed you know, in the clips, those are the petitions that worker strike back activists have and socialist alternative members have been using in Seattle and some other cities where we are reaching people on that basis. We are not we are not purveyors of illusions that uncommitted will somehow be enough and then you turn around and vote for biden in november and we are also not being blasé about the real fears that people have of trump you know one of the reasons the lesser evilism keeps rearing its head every presidential year is because there isn't an alternative that people see as viable to push back against democrats and republicans so uh, i I, I think that it is that more people than before are understanding the dead end of voting for Democrats and Republicans. But uh, in November, we, we cannot, you know, those of us who are trying to lead on the left, we cannot put the burden on ordinary people and say, you know, you, again, you voted for a sellout. But for us, it's for us to see that, well, the reason that keeps happening, much less the phenomenon of Trump getting working class support is that there are no viable options. And so that's why it is so important for us to continually connect any vote for Jill Stein or uh, Cornell West. First of all, it's important for us to call for the vote and also uh, say that this for us, this is not an end in itself because it's going to be a small vote. It's it's to build the building blocks of the uh, of a new party for working people. And from that, with that end in mind, it is important that we fight for the strongest independent left vote in November. Uh, and in that context, I'll just one last thing I'll say is that it's, a, you know, Cornell West, unfortunately, the campaign is uh, doing a disservice, a huge disservice to working class people and the oppressed, because it's extremely disappointing to see how weak his campaign has been. And especially that that weakness continues since the uh, Gaza war broke out because, as I said earlier, genuinely Cornell West has a track record. You know, it's not like he's going to put on a, a face. You know, it's not going. To, it's, it's not a pretense. He genuinely feels that, but that is not showing up in the strength of the campaign. He has not. When we conducted an interview with Cornell West on on strike, uh, which maybe you can show a clip of that, I asked yeah, I him that. again about you know why aren't you holding mass rallies? When are you going to start holding mass rallies? I gave the example of Bernie Sanders, who. <laughs> Yeah, by, by October of the previous year, meaning October of last year or October of 2015, Bernie had already had, um, I think, 100,000 people attend his rallies or something like that, or maybe even more, I can't remember. But the fact is that he was holding mass rallies in multiple cities, organized along a very clear working class program. And remember, people made the corporate media made fun of Bernie for giving the same speech everywhere 
but it that's what's important that's what you do in order to let working people know this is what you stand for and that's why you should come and fight with us obviously it was a fatal fatal flaw that he ran as a democrat and had illusions and not to mention since then he has gone even further really completely uh turning the roar of his ca- working class program into a whimper just completely selling out to clinton and then to biden and then uh, of course one of the most um, striking uh, failures uh, and betrayals was refusing to call for a ceasefire you know when when millions were saying that he should so all of this shows that we need a real working class alternative and i think honestly in terms of uh, practical measures it's unfortunate that um, that cornell west is not running as a green party candidate it would be much better if there was any prospect of cornell west and jill stein running on the same ticket and and then for us to to really push for the left i mean to push for the strongest independent left candidate the the splintering of these votes is not helping the left it's not helping working people it's almost like he did all the actions that would help the democratic party and the people that are against a uprising left wing movement how what 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 would what would you do if you want to tank the 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 surge of left wing third party activism not saying he did it but you would do exactly what he's doing <laughs> Yeah, so Shama, if you if you didn't hadn't heard our critique of Cornell West campaign, everything you said, we have we also had the same critique. We do take it slightly further. Of course, we're not asking you to agree with it, but just to restate what we said, we do, and, and Nick was just alluding to it. We we there's no way um we feel like there's no way that this person could have gone through and have all the knowledge he has and make mistakes, these grave mistakes in a row. There's no way that that cannot be intentional, in my opinion. Yeah, there's I just no enough. way. I there's think there's no way that this cannot be intentional. It's just one bad decision after another. And I held um, off on that theory for a while, CJ, but after. I've seen enough. Yeah, I had got there. I had got there earlier. I, I must admit, I must admit, I didn't give him a shot because I, I saw, I just saw it earlier. But, but anyway, we, we are going to be talking about Cornell West, Bernie Sanders a, a little bit in a, just a second. But I do want to ask, uh, talk more, a little bit more about this before we move on, which is this is from Socialist Alternative website because you're, you, you've been, and you've yeah, been be right talking about this yourself. You've been talking about we need a new party. We need a new party. I'm hearing you speak that a lot more than I've heard before. And let me just read a couple of snippets from this article. It says, voting uncommitted is an important vehicle to register public anger at Biden's policies, but it can only have a lasting impact if the campaign in opposition to Biden is taken up through. I think that should say through. I think that's a typo the general um, election um, itself. So uh, before I read on, um, what, this is the question I posed to, to, the, to the panel, what would, you, what would you say is the value of expressing your dissatisfaction in the primary without expressing your dissatisfaction in the general? What value can be extracted from that in your opinion is there a value that can be extracted from that because it's it's our opinion that there's it's like it's like giving yourself credit for a dress rehearsal and then in in the actual performance you're doing something completely different so um is there a value in voting uncommitted in the primary and then voting for biden in the general i kind of know your answer but if you want to elaborate a little bit more on that point yeah of course I, i'm glad you asked the question in that way because um let, let me start with a hypothetical it doesn't exist unfortunately for working people and for the left but had we had a really strong independent left anti-war pro-working class campaign of the kind we have run in seattle but for the presidential election uh, that we didn't we didn't think we didn't believe was going to win actually in the presidential election because we don't have that uh, prediction that it would win. But we but had we had a strong enough campaign where we knew that it was actually going to galvanize the attention of millions of Americans and that 
uh, if we had uh, the campaign like that, you know, go on through November, and if we had actual concrete strategy to use that to then launch the a new party or a new some some sort of new organization, maybe not a party immediately. You know, it depends on what what support we have and all that. Uh, but something concrete that could be launched coming out of the November election. If that were the case, then we would not be asking this question, right? We would we would be voting for that candidate in the primaries in as many ballots, and we would fight to get them as many uh, ballots. For example, we, we would fight to, sorry, I'm sort of mixing the two primaries in November. For an independent left candidate, most likely the scenario would have been that we would fight to get them on the ballot as many in, in as many states as possible in November. And in the primaries, most likely the strategy we would have had is of a write-in campaign. And it would have been hard, but it would have been worth fighting for. I mean, I don't know if some of your viewers might know that in 2021, I was facing a recall effort from the Chamber of Commerce and from the Democratic Party, and we prevail against that recall. But we we had to the campaign strategy campaign had to have a strategy to deal with this complication where we're telling people to vote against the recall because there wasn't it, it wasn't like my name on the ballot it was recall Shama Sawant yes or no and that presents presents campaigning uh, challenges but you have to overcome them by having a very strong organizing very strong political basis for the campaign and it can be done so had we had such an independent left campaign that was really strong really galvanizing around a, a, a strong set of political demands economic demands and so on anti-war we would have called for a write-in vote in the primary and then we would have begun planning for the general election now i'm saying that because precisely because we don't have that and what in the absence of that, what we have is the uncommitted effort. And I, like I said, I don't have illusions in the leadership uh, of, of the campaigns. I mean, as I said, I, I'll commend them if they do stick to the, the idea of not voting for Biden and uh, supporting Jill Stein or Connell West. I have spoken to a couple of activists who said that they would, but they're more rank and file activists. I've not spoken to the leadership. I, I would like to, but I haven't been able to reach them. Uh, but for the most part, I expect that they won't. And uh, in fact, uh, about the abandoned Biden leaders have said that they won't support Biden un unless there's a ceasefire and you have to read between the lines. I think what it genuinely means, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not talking about the intent of those, those activists, but ultimately what it means is that if there's any sort of temporary ceasefire, or even if Biden just talks about ceasefire, I expect mm -hmm. that they will use their authority to pressure people to vote for Biden. So I'm more interested, and we should all be more interested in what the rank and file who are voting uncommitted think. And beyond that, all the millions of people, and this goes to your point, CJ, the millions of working and young people who didn't vote in the primaries, who weren't going to vote in the primaries, but are interested in having a channel for their anger against Biden and Trump. And so our interest in, in the uncommitted effort is along those lines where we want to push for our interest in pushing for the largest possible uncommitted vote is because we want to push towards that. But we are doing that while recognizing that, unfortunately, given where things are, uh, Uncommitted is a limited expression. It is a lim very limited expression. We want to use that to build the working class movement, the movement for a new party, and to build the socialist movement in the United States. And uh, and that's our you know ultimately that's what our goal. We want to build the socialist movement. This year, the presidential election is the main political discussion with which uh, most working class people are tuned into, and we need to orient towards it in the most effective way. See, the, the best and only way of building a working class movement, of building a socialist movement, is not by standing on the sidelines, but also not by cheerleading weak movements. You know, so for example, we are not among those uh, activists uh, who, activist leaders, for example, some of whom write for Jacobin and other publications, who just mm -hmm. cheerlead uh, the labor leadership uncritically or the cheerlead uh, efforts yes. like uncommitted uncritically. We're not doing that. We're being very honest with people and saying that this is a limited effort, but ultimately we need to channel this towards an effective fight back this year against the Trump and Biden type of uh, options. Also not having illusions in RFK and point the fight towards 
working class and socialist politics. You know, we are not going to win a socialist revolution by, uh, as we all know, by standing on a street corner and saying one solution revolution. That's why we are having this serious conversation, which I appreciate. And so for us, it's the question of how do we build our forces by orienting to important, uh, but very imperfect developments like uncommitted. That's that's the question. Yeah, I 100% I agree with what you're saying because I just explained earlier how the professional managerial class, because I was listening to the whole thing, I had some, some stuff going on in the background, but the professional managerial class is ch trying to hijack the uncommitted vote. So as revolutionaries, shouldn't we try to do the same? Even if yes. you see the PMC <laughs> class try to bring them back into a Democratic Party, does this serve us to try to be the counterbalance to that? So it's like Shama said, it's, it's important to be clear about the limits of this tactic, but we can use this tactic as a way to bring people to more revolutionary mind, uh, mind, minded way of thinking. And that's kind of the conclusion I came up with this, especially seeing how this is catching like wildfire and not only just the uh, Arab uh, American community, you got black and Latino communities that follow in suit. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's nothing but a positive thing and only represent uh, the potential, the revolutionary potential of the proletariat right now. But go ahead, CJ. Yeah, and generally just read the, sec the second part, and then I'm going to bring up a video here. All working class and oppressed people who have been left out to dry by the Democratic Party should I think Shama unite was, under... Yeah, sorry, I think Shama wants to chime in. So, sorry, Go ahead. I'm sorry, Shama. I'm sorry. I couldn't see you. Oh, no, no, no. I, I just uh, messaged you about it. I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, what you're about to talk about is important, CJ. I just wanted to say that in terms of, you know, oh, what ahead. we were saying just now and what Nick was saying about what is our... Uh, role, those of us who are genuinely uh, have the understanding that we need a socialist revolution, we understand that capitalism cannot be fixed, we need a socialist revolution, but, when that, but, but that we're not going to get there by standing on the sidelines. We have to connect with actual working people who are angry. And I think one aspect of this that should be pointed out, we, we all know this, but you know, in terms of having a discussion that informs your viewership also, is that one uh, serious um, um, uh, failure of the socialist left would be is if he left the field to the misleaders. You know, so on the one hand, we believe that cheerleaders, the uncritical cheerleaders are huge, doing a huge disservice. And some of them are actually doing that deeply cynically, looking out for their own careers, looking out for just, uh, you know, the, to not be adversarial towards powerful people. That is part of what explains the fact that AOC has been able to sell out again and again, because there is a whole uh, machinery that gives her cover. Uh, and uh, we don't want any part of that. But we also don't want, in the name of sort of being purist or something like that, to leave the field to the misleaders. So if we weren't there talking about what uncommitted means, that it represents the anger of ordinary people and where it needs to go, then it won't go there. There's no prospect of that going there because the field is left uninterrupted for the people who intend to ultimately they uh, lead everyone back to Biden and the Democratic Party. So we are the only voices against it, helping people understand that they don't have to make that choice. Uh, and if we didn't do that, imagine, uh, you know, what a huge disservice we would be doing. It would be a dereliction of political duty on our part. That's actually something Nick and I and all of us really say, because we hear the critiques. You guys you know, every they say you guys seem to always have a, an analysis, a critique about everything that comes out. John Fetterman, this and that it was like, yes, because we need to be very honest with uh, the workers. And that was something that Nick made as his top goal this year. Remember, Nick, he was like yeah, this year, year we have to be crystal clear Clarity. with workers. No illusions. No whatsoever. Confusion. Right. All. And. Uh, just to uh, seal this uh, segment up, I'll read this last part. All working class and oppressed people who have been left out to drive for the Democratic Party should unite under uncommitted and abandoned uh, Biden banners and begin constructing a working class political alternative to the rotten two party system or uh, parties of war. An important step in this process will be mobilizing as many people as possible to protest the Democratic National Convention this summer and using those protests as launching pads for the conference to find a new anti-war pro-worker party. I wanted to make sure I include that because we're one of the team, we're one of the people in our community, Shama, that is 
we'll, we're we're planning to raise money to to send RBN members out to Chicago for exactly what this article uh, ends up saying here. Um, and yeah, we definitely um, be there. Yeah, and, and to your other point that you were just mentioning about, you were essentially saying we can't be um out of the game we can't be sitting on the sidelines and letting these you know these pseudo left the the ryan grimms for examples of the worlds be the mouthpieces for this we need to be in the room we need to be at the table speaking and you speak about it uh quite uh, clearly no, no. here as we pivot to um sellouts now the way I have it set up is the third party stuff is later, even though we, we all have been itching to talk about it because I want to use the third party segment as the solution part to what we're talking about. So we're talking about the sellouts first, and then we're going to end up talking about the solution part, which is third parties, um, talk about the candidates, and also talk about a vision for a new party in the future. But let's listen to Shaman with the last time she was on. This is a classic uh, clip here. Who's my old place? Story. The other part of the story is all the Ryan Grimm's of this world. We have to be very clear. They are cynical purveyors. They are snake oil salesmen who are very consciously peddling the Democratic Party support. And you know, I think on uh, Twitter, some people are tweeting like, "Hey, are you a masochist? Why are you going towards Ryan Grimm? Why are you going to these podcasts if you know that uh, you're you're not going to get any agreement on these things?" But we have to be clear, he's not he's not doing some engaging in some self-sacrifice, and it is not about him, it's about people like him. People like him are determinedly peddling this line, even more so now, because the democratic establishment recognizes that this is very clear as a betrayal in the eyes of hundreds of thousands of unconvinced and perhaps even millions of workers. That now, if you remember, this was uh, right around the breaking of the rail strike and Ryan was trying to convince people that somehow it was part of the plan. And what? Yeah. And I think even at that time, I was saying something very similar to this, which is the last 12 to 24 months have been have crystallized the notion that the working class people really don't have anybody in the inside, we really don't have anybody working for us. Progressive Democrats have moved considerably uh, and noticeably to the right, uh, voting to break a strike and, and running cover for the reactionary murderous uh, Biden administration. Elected pro uh, progressives have really shown their cards. They've shown when having to make a choice between progressive policies and establishment policies, they will pick establishment policies or the status quo um all the time so 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 just broadly speaking um what is the way to sort of um diminish diminish the effects of of said sellouts that are embedded everywhere in a movement that's trying to get off the ground and in a lot of ways they are the impediment they are the ones that diffuses excitement. They are the ones that, um, you know, lead the movement down a rabbit hole with some some bogus stories. So how do we, how do we rise above that? How do we, you know, how do we maneuver through something like that? Yeah, I think that's a very important question you asked. That how do, how do we how do we uh, overcome them? And just to start with. I don't think that we can uh, we can just remove them in the sense that this is capitalism, unless and until humanity, you know, working class people led by working class people succeeds in ending capitalism, overthrowing capitalism, and ushering in socialism. Uh, that these sellouts are going to be all over the place. There is no prospect of building a movement and in fact much less a revolutionary movement for socialism uh, without these sellouts around every corner you better believe it they're going to be there because that is the nature of this system it you know the system's injustice and its absurdity not to mention now the environmental and climate crisis 
it points people towards the need to overthrow capitalism and then it generates revolutionaries like some of us uh, but and also uh, propels mass layers to fight back but the system also has its own corruption and it it it, it it fuels the creation of these kinds of sellouts. So uh, there's always going to be a Ryan Grimm. There's always going to be a Pramila Jayapal. There's going to, always going to be an AOC. The question is, uh, how do we, you know, as long as we are fighting on the basis of, you know, in, in the context of capitalism is what I mean. Uh, then the question is, how do we expose them? How do we defeat them? And how do we win victories despite the fact that they're around? I mean, and, and I'll tell you, even if we succeed and we we better succeed in it because this is crucial it's a crucial step building a new party for working people we should expect that some of these progressives in the democratic party they if if they see this project succeeding some of them will jump ship and come Maybe. and join this party but not to actually build it they will they will uh, arrive as cynical elements and then they will uh become the right wing of that party so it's not like it's going to be just a uh, we're not going to go. Yeah, we're not going to coast to victory. Every step of the way is going to be a fight. Struggle. So we have to yeah. sign up if we want. If we want to overthrow capitalism and fight for a socialist society, then it has to be. You have to sign up for relentless fight back. Especially those of us who are playing a leadership role. More is demanded of us. And so, when I ran for office, I was not. And, and obviously, my organization, Socialist Alternative, we were not. We did not run for office to reform the system. We ran for office to expose it. We, the, we had no idea that I was going to get elected and I, I was going to agree with some of the things that Democrats were saying and then not agree with some of them just to get some sort of victory for working people within the system. And they're my colleagues. I was told many times, they're your colleagues. Why aren't you being nice to them? You know, stuff like that. But we were crystal clear. And if you're not, it's the downfall of the working class that we are not there to make even a limited peace with them. No, we are there to expose the system and expose yeah, the people who represent that, that system. That. And, <laughs> and every step we take, even the, you know, we, we obviously we don't have any illusion that we're gonna build a social Seattle or anything like that, or, or build socialism through running for office, running one candidate for office. We don't have such illusion. But for that whole decade that I was in office, at every moment, our, objective ultimately is to build the revolutionary socialist movement so i ran for office as a bolshevik that was my clear understanding uh, and we didn't win the victories we win accidentally we won them because we are bolsheviks and socialist alternative and we were very clear that we are revolutionaries and we approach every task including elected office as a revolutionary and so this is the one of the most important things for us to understand if you want to diminish the effects of the sellout that are embedded as you said cj that was yeah. the question uh, and i'll just give you a concrete example you know in it, it like i said it was never an e there was never one day that was easy or oh uh, one well there was one day when all the democrats were at peace with us no they were at absolute war with us because they're representing the capitalist interests and they were clear we are anti-capitalist. We are representing anti-capitalist interests. They understood that very clearly. They understood I was a Marxist. So there was no peace between us. And it was a mutual, mutually agreed, uh, you know, battle lines were drawn. But the reason we won, despite having just one position among nine, is that we built the base for working people to fight back. We forced the union leadership of some of the unions that didn't agree with us because their rank and file were supporting us. We also fortunately had one or two left union leaders who supported us uh, on their own basis. And it was that kind of mass organizing that helped us win victories. And because of that, ultimately what happened, you know, is that, uh, I mean, the city council has always been Democrat as far as I know, because it, the consciousness of ordinary people in Seattle is well to the left of the politician yeah. so the d were i mean it's always democrats but what did change is that we because of the way we organized and won we drove out the most overtly uh corporate chamber of commerce type of mouthpieces that we had on the city council and 
uh, one after one after one, we drove them out. You know, they went and found alternate careers because it was no longer a cushy job, which gave them a six figure salary while hobnobbing over wine and cheese with the Chamber of Commerce. They, yeah, they that's right. This is not easy no more, man. This is, I thought we were going to chill, man. It was easy no more. And, and not only was it not easy, they were That's exposed easy. to hundreds of people coming to City Hall and calling them out, saying, you're a sellout. How dare you say that a worker at McDonald's should go and get a second job because she's so poor, she can't even buy small trinkets for her child. And I'm not making this up. This 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 example actually happened in City Hall with this guy, the city council member telling her, can't you get a second job? This woman is the black working class woman from McDonald's sitting there tearfully saying she's so poor, she can't buy little trinkets for her child. And this guy says that, I remember that with so much anger, the anger never goes away. But my point is that because we succeeded on a mass, you know, sort of organizing basis, one after one, there was an exodus of these chamber of commerce type mouthpieces and the Democratic Party was forced to contend with our setting of the political agenda and they were forced to run progressives. And I'm saying progressives and I'm doing air quotes, but it's important to understand. <laughs> it's forced. I mean, I don't want illusions in them, but. We also have to recognize it, it, it demonstrates the pressure on the Democrats to weed out their Chamber of Commerce people and bring in these so-called progressives because they were under, you know, they had to show that they were progressive. They they keep saying they're progressive, but they're not. They were for, they were exposed. And so exposing them is what, what is needed. Uh, it, we cannot leave uh, working class people to be, uh, to be, you know, we cannot leave working class people's fate to the capitalist politicians. We have to always challenge them. And the Bolsheviks did that in Russia. You know, in, in, as a matter of fact, they had multiple representatives in the Russian parliament, which was called the Duma. And Lenin actually worked very closely with those elected to the Duma because he saw the central importance of that work. And in fact, Karl Marx himself made this very clear that the working class cannot be abstentionist. That it would be a massive mistake, but it's a question of how you, what does it look like for revolutionary leadership to be in the halls of capitalist power? Th that has to be, um, you know, it has to be, um, we have to be unbending is what I'm trying to say. We have to be unbending on that understanding. There cannot be a few days where you're revolutionary in a few days and the rest of the, the time you're not. No, being a revolutionary means always being in uh, an adversarial position from the representatives of the capitalist system, but it also means not abstaining. And it, it, so it means I'm, getting Bolsheviks elected, but also having a fundamentally different approach. Sorry, I went on. I'm sure was, Nick might want to chime in. Rant. No, go ahead, go ahead, CJ. I do want to chime in, but you can go ahead first. No, I'll say I'm sure both of us want to rant here because, or, or at least say something, not rant, but say something because the reason we're both sort of chuckling, I would assume it's the same reason you can say it, it's not, is that we are in, in this space, we have to deal where we feel like we're always pulling people. Come on, let's go to the yeah. left. Let's go. Come on. It's so refreshing to be in conversation with somebody that's like, no, put the foot on the gas. Let's keep going. Let's do it's so refreshing to be in conversation with you and a person who has that same mindset as like this. There's yeah, no, we don't have to drag. Yeah, there's none of that. But go ahead, Nick. I know you want to. Talk That's to my point. Like, about it her, been, yeah. I'm, I've been talking about it publicly the frustration I felt ever since I've been in this space, like the nonstop gaslighting by the professional managerial class, the nonstop tone policing. Like, you, you guys know, like the 90% of the criticism I get is not based on positions I take, not based on on the coverage I do, not based on what I cover. It's It's been toned from day one. It always came from the professional managerial class. And CJ, you got it all the time as well. What's the number one criticism people had at RBN? Why you guys keep going after these motherfuckers, man? Come on, aren't they the best of the best? Why you guys keep calling out the Ryan Grimm, the Bernie Sanders, and all these people? And they viewed us as being like this, oh, man, they just want to talk shit for clicks. They don't understand that we can't allow these charlatans to spread their lives freely. We need to view them as adversarial. And RBN, we were the first channel. Well, I wouldn't say first, I wouldn't say first, but we was a very prominent channel that came out. And we was like, no, we're not doing this thing where we typically criticizing you. Like, oh, we think you good on this. No, we coming out and treating you the same way we would treat someone we were adversarial to. 
because we are. And Ryan Graham was one of the many people. David Sirota was another like golden goose that couldn't be touched. And then we started going after David Sirota. People were like, oh my God, because people wasn't used to that. And we told people no. So I love the the fact that you said we should be adversary. We should be calling these people out. Because look at what Ryan Graham is doing. People want me to give these people a cookie. You against a genocide and you want a fucking cookie because you're against a genocide. No, Ryan Grimm, despite his good Gaza coverage, once again, Crystal, Gaza coverage, good. It's easy to get that right. Fam, we, we, what are we talking about? It's easy to get that right. Look at this. AOC, after refusing, and I'm interjecting this. I apologize, CJ, because this is based on- No, what no. You, yeah, this after is right along AOC was called out by the working class because she refused to call what's going on in Gaza a genocide. And now she pretend, well, well, I don't, it's just terms and labels. That was what Bernie and AOC was saying. Oh, just terms. No, there's a reason why they wasn't saying that because it implicates Biden. It's not like an innocent mistake. So AOC took so much pressure that six months after the genocide, now we in a famine, fam. 100,000 dead. Now she finally said the word genocide. And look who, look who is here to praise AOC, Shama. I know that was a long preface to this. But you guys see what this guy is here for? He says, after a slow start, that's one hell of a way to put it. After a slow start, AOC has become one of the most forceful voices. You guys see how they're here to confuse, to elevate AOC instead of the working class people that was in the street risking police violence? So anyway, I'll bring this up. You guys can comment on it if you want. I just want to interject this. <laughs> Ahead, yeah, let me let me because this is actually part. This is later on, but we can interject it here because right. it fits. Because um, what I wanted, to, what my comment was on this is that you notice how these social democrats they're fine with sort of pairing genocide to famine. They're not fine with pairing genocide with deaths by bombs because they're complicit in their own minds with that, with their votes. So, and I noticed this because I noticed when, I forget what other progressive was talking about it, they kept talking about the famine, which is true, but it's just curious to me that that's where they feel comfortable um, saying you're starving people and not necessarily the military action that brought, you know, 30, 40,000 plus uh, uh, deaths. Um, but my, to, to pivot sort of to stay on ALC and ask the final question on this, and then we're going to go to third party stuff in the last sort of 30, 40 minutes that we have here. Um, let me bring this up here. And just to get your general sort of either understanding and in and, and and analysis of the news of ALC and Sanders unveil Green New Deal for housing. And just to understand, this is a reintroducing and this is something they do every year, and I call it their off season. That's when they <laughs> want to bring up all these bills. <laughs> like when the yeah. season is over, if you're in any sport, it doesn't matter. Like your season is over, and then the person want to go and run the, the most laps and be like, "What? What, is, what does this do? What does this do?" You get what I'm saying? So this is what they do, and this is how the sellouts, um, Shama. This is how they keep their audience engaged they have to at some point come out with policy and talk about policy that presumably presumably their audience um, believes, the people that follow them uh, agrees with. So they throw these bait out, but you notice they don't never, they never or rarely come up with all of this legislation when they're in power. The Ro Khanna's, the Pramila Jayapal's, the AOC's, the Bernie Sanders, since, since um, they've lost the house, They've introduced well over 15 bills combined, well over. But when they had the House, crickets. So uh, uh, just broadly, because I don't want to have to go into the article, but broadly speaking, you know, not the policy, because I agree with the policy. A Green New Deal for housing would be great. A real Green New Deal for housing would be great. But the what I'm, what I'm asking you about is their use of this topic, their use of the Green New Deal for housing in order to keep people invested in their their charlatan game. Could you speak to that part, uh, Shama? I think there is a lot to be said about what you're saying. These are, um, I mean, even if we uh, even if we were to assume, way, hey, we don't know in any given case what 
what motives are driving them. I think if you look overall at the way the Democratic Party operates, you see this type of theme as exactly like you're saying, they, in order to deflect, when there is pressure on them, see, when there's no pressure on them, they're not even bothering to look a certain progressive, you know, they, they're doing what they're doing, which is their normal way of functioning, which is generally uttering a few progressive things, but, but mostly very um, comfortably doing the bidding of Wall Street. And obviously in this case, uh, the interests of imp US imperialism. But when they are under pressure, they resort to all kinds of tactics. And one of the tactics is the tactic of deflection by uh, trying to deflect attention away from the most important issue of the day to then saying, oh, we're going to do new Green New Deal. Well, what stopped you from fighting for the Green New Deal type of housing from day one? You know, why is it that you're talking about it now and you're talking about it, but what are you actually going to do to fight to win it? Those are also the questions. I mean, it's it's not like it's not like these demo these progressive Democrats or the, even the squad members. It's not like you can say, well, you know, they're very weak on this issue <coughs> on war and imperialism. It's unforgivable that they didn't stand up against the war. However, they have been absolute fighters for housing for working people in America. It's not like that. You know, it's not like th these issues operate in silos. Uh, sort of um, in isolation from one another in their minds. Ultimately, being anti-war, being against US imperialism, uh, being uh, in favor of taxes on billionaires, for example, to fund various needs, being in, in favor of Medicare for all, these are not isolated positions. How, uh, how you stand on any of those positions is going to be revealing of how you stand on all of them. You know, so uh, we have to, it's, it's important, I agree, to draw out the cynicism in this where there's a lot of pressure on her in relation to the war, but then uh, she, um, you know, she fails on that and then she ends up saying something like this, where I think the question we should ask is, okay, this is great, but what are you actually going to do to fight to win it? I mean, sloganeering is fine, introducing bills are fine. And do you know how many bills are introduced? In Congress, do you know how many bills are introduced by Democrats in state legislatures? Countless, but not even a fraction of it is actually won because this is the way, they, this is the gimmickry they engage in. They put forward bills, present no strategy for fighting back, uh, let alone organizing on a mass basis, which is the only thing that they can do actually to win something. They have no obligation of any uh, of that kind. So it's not only the tactics of deflection, it's also what do, what are they doing in these in this supposed perpetrated issue that they claim that they're going to uh, bring forward and let's not for one second for, forget her record regarding gaza and, and and the record of bernie sanders you know they aoc attacked the protest movement last fall and she abstained on the iron dome and she's been very weak on all these issues and that is on top of as i said these are not isolated issues she's been She's, she has betrayed on many fronts and she has not really led on any building a movement on any of these, whether it's Medicare for all or the fight against the war on Gaza. So it's, you know, it's all of that. Yeah, and, and, and the reason, the reason it's ahead. all of that and not just one thing is because any of that, if you are going to fight for any of that, it would immediately make you enemy number one of the democratic establishment of the uh, the the ruling class as a whole, the capitalism as a whole, and that is why I keep going back to this point about what kind of elected representatives do we need? What kind of fight back do we need? It has to be on a Marxist basis. In other words, what we want is Marxism, not Bernieism. Ah, oh, 